This video is brought to you by the folks at Skillshare, but more on that a little later. Salutations, traveler. I'm Vince, also known as Pleasant Kenobi on the internet. And in today's video, I'm going to talk to you about the dichotomy between broken and boring. A sliding scale of things that, I guess, on either side, players and game designers do not want to find themselves in. Two undesirable ends of the power level scale. The last thing you want to be in a game is bored. A strength and at times an issue with Magic as a game is that is constantly changing and evolving. It is hard to get bored of a format of, or gameplay pattern within Magic when there are so many different formats to play and new product landing on our laps every five minutes. In 2021 alone we had Calderheim, Time Spiral Remastered, Strixhaven School of Mages, Modern Horizons 2, Dungeons and Dragons Adventures in Dice Rolling, Innistrad Midnight Hunt and Innistrad It's a Wedding Lodge. And that's not including any other random side products, secret layers, and other things that, although they don't necessarily, well, I was going to say they don't bring anything new to the game in terms of gameplay, but that's not true now either, is it? Because secret layers can bring new, mechanically unique magic cards. So, that's actually an incorrect statement in my script. Some might argue it's all a little bit too much, but others might argue it keeps the game fresh and interesting. There is a wider debate about fatigue and keeping up, and if every product is for you or needs to be for everyone, but that's a different video. Each of these sets bring with it a unique limited environment in which new gameplay experiences have to be forged from new cards and new mechanics, and then even cards, even sets like Time Square Remastered brought us a new limited environment by remixing an old collection of sets. Beyond Limited, most sets bring a new world and a new cast of characters expanding magic story in exciting and interesting ways. Calderheim brought us, uh, and the main characters too, to a Viking plane, complete with longboats, runes, and its own pantheon of Nordic-inspired gods. Meanwhile, Strixhaven was totally not Harry Potter, honest. It also managed to take Liliana and give her some real hot teacher energy too. Wow. But of course, for many, myself included, it's not the story or the world or even the limited environment for the most part that brings us to each set. Although some of us are limited players and I wish I played more limited, but it's constructed. It's how each of the new cards interacts with all the older formats, whether that be Standard, Modern, Legacy, Pioneer, Vintage, or Commander. Every set brings with it hundreds of new cards, and with each of these new cards being injected into Constructed, it's new spaces to be explored by the design team, it's new gameplay to be invented, it's new mechanics to be introduced. But with dozens of new mechanics and hundreds of new cards being added to the game in regular installments, some are going to shine and become staples. Others will falter and fall to the wayside, and a few will perhaps push the envelope a little bit too far. <laughs> game design, and by extension game balance, is not easy. I believe that gamers and critics often overlook this, this gets sidelined, we forget to even consider it when we're being critical of power creep or boring sets. In the case of Magic, it's creating hundreds if not thousands of new cards each year and having those cards interact in new and surprising ways that we're not caught in testing. We often lament when cards are underpowered and boring and we lambast wizards when they push the power level and break things too. Striking a delicate balance between boring and broken seems like a near impossible task. In all honesty, in order to do this, it would require a lot more time, energy and resources than I think wizards gets from Papa Hasbro. If they were to have robust um, development teams that had huge playtesting teams too, then they could probably get closer to this middle ideal of somewhere between the boring and broken. But the truth is they just don't have those teams. We are told openly and honestly by Wizards of the Coast that they just don't play test for things outside of standard. So when things break, modern or legacy or even commander I believe, although in recent times there is a now a casual play design team that might work on that sort of thing, but when cards break these older formats, it's not necessarily because they were trying, although there is an argument that power creep does create artificial rotation which I'll come to in a moment, but it's also because, well, no one saw it coming because no one was looking. And whilst it's just not easy to increase the size of your teams for playtesting, and this video isn't exclusively about playtesting, but I think it requires to be talked about as part of the video, if they spent a little bit of their record profits, which is the coast make a lot of money for Hasbro, if they spent a little bit of those record profits back on growing the playtesting teams and those development teams, then perhaps they'd be able to strike a better balance. The problem is that Oh, well, the counter-argument is that Modern and Legacy don't make as much money as, say, Standard or Commander or Arena does. And thusly, it's just not worth caring in that regard. And that's a shame. But again, I'm going to reiterate, there is a delicate balance between boring and broken that is very, very hard to toe the line with. Both sides are places players don't necessarily want to be, and game designers don't want to find their game either. Mark Rosewater has some interesting things to say on this topic, but we will come to that in just a moment. 
But first, this video is brought to you by Skillshare. There'll be a link in the description below. I've been using Skillshare to improve my lighting setup, how I utilize cameras, and also just how I utilize graphical assets within videos too. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of online classes, presenters, and members across 150 countries, looking to encourage and inspire you to take the next step in your creative journey. For me, it's helped to improve the visual identity of the channel and my brand. Learning about Photoshop from classes like Cat Cookalettes, learn Adobe Photoshop like a pro in order to improve the thumbnails I use right here on YouTube. You can easily find the right classes for you by searching any topic you need that you want to develop on, or alternatively use Skillshare's hand-picked learning paths to develop a set of skills with associated videos from multiple creators creating a sort of a, uh, a whole series of classes on one topic, whether that be DSLR photography or Photoshop or After Effects. The first 1,000 people to click the link in the description below will get their first month of Skillshare free and use the code Pleasant Kenobi so they can take the next step in their creative journey. So what are you waiting for? Get involved. There's a link in the description below. Thanks to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. Right, back to magic. Let's talk a little bit about boring versus broken. I've also created my share of boring mechanics, yet very few people ever had passion and purpose to stop me from making those. Why? Because people fear challenging the players more than boring them. But I think that's backwards. When you try something grandiose and it fails, the players will forgive you because they recognize that you were trying to do something awesome. They respect the attempt. And they stick around to see what you'll do next. But when you bore the players, there's no such forgiveness. Because making the same mistake is not the same as making a new one. When you bore the players, they resent you. Sometimes they stop playing. So as game designers, I think we have it reversed. Challenging the players isn't the bigger threat. The greatest risk is not taking risks. Like I said, this is a delicate balance that Wizards gets right from time to time. Zendikar block was powerful, but nothing too gross. Scars of Mildin comes Hello along, there. adds some swords and a battle skull to the mix, and suddenly you have Jace the Mind Sculptor and Stoneforge Mystic from Zendikar block needing to be banned in standard. The first stunning bannings in half a decade, six years approximately. Uh, that was back in a period when standard bannings were quite rare unlike in recent times. Sometimes it's hard to plan for how cards are going to interact with other cards, even within a few sets of each other. After Scars of Mildred and Block, which include New Phyrexia and Living Weapon as a mechanic that was very good, well, it was very good on Bascal, we saw um, Innistrad, which might be the platonic ideal of a magic set. It toes the middle line between boring and broken very well. Cards like Snapcaster, Liliana, Past in Flames, Unburial Rites, Crater Hoof, Grizzlebrand, and of course, Delver of Secrets, they all came to define multiple formats. And with the exception of potentially Grizzlebrand, nothing was truly oppressive or broken. If Innistrad sits bang in the center of this boring versus broken dichotomy, perhaps in the, the aspirational area that we all want to get to, where it's powerful enough to excite and not be forgettable, what do the other ends of that spectrum look like? In the boring camp, we have the original Theros, perhaps, or more recently, Calderheim. Sets that once they were trade out of standard, were lucky to leave behind more than a handful, or less than a handful in many cases, eternal format staples, cards that get played later down the line. Uh, Theros block has a few, uh, one of which being the reprint of Thoughtseize, but yeah, ultimately very forgettable. Even at the time, people were commenting on how boring Born of the Gods and Journey into Nyx were, and they are probably the reason that we don't have multi-set blocks today. On the flip side of that, we have Khans, Ikoria, and Throne of fucking Eldraine. And for the record, I actually look back fondly on Throne of Eldraine. I like the theme. I like a lot of cards in there, but the power creep was a bit too much. Khans brought back fetches, which many think was a mistake, putting more fetches into modern, uh, having them have to be initially banned in Pioneer, for example, too. But they also gave us Delve as a mechanic, something that is tied with Phyrexian Mana for the most banned cards on the modern ban list. That's right, Delve and Phyrexian Mana are probably the most broken mechanics ever printed. Like, more so than Storm or Dredge or Affinity, potentially. That's some videos that I want to do on deep dives on each of these mechanics. This is originally a Delve deep dive video, but it evolved into this instead. I did speak briefly to Gavin Verhey of Wizard of the Coast to ask him what he thinks constitutes a broken card in Magic. A broken mechanic cheats the fundamental rules and restrictions of Magic itself, and most often via the two most valuable resources, cards and mana. Affinity cheats on mana. Companion gives you an extra card. Urza's block untap mechanic refunds your mana. Dredge gives you access to a tremendous number of additional cards, and so on. This doesn't encapsulate every broken mechanic, 
but it does capture a lot of them. We do a lot now to try and scrutinize mechanics that do either of these two things. In recent years, we have had more broken cards and broken mechanics than, well, almost any other time in Magic, barring perhaps the early days when they were finding their feet. This started in 2019, May and June respectively, War of the Spark and Modern Horizons 1, where power creep just accelerated out of nowhere into lofty, lofty heights. The envelope was being pushed to a point that it probably shouldn't have been. There was a few factors for this. The first one was that Modern Horizons allowed direct printing into Modern, sidestepping the normal standard legality, allowing cards to be pushed in power level, and then for them to be a bit more bold with what they put out. There was no way cards like Hogak, Urza, or Force of Negation would have ever made its way into Standard. But even beyond the direct to older formats pipeline that Horizons provided, the power level of Standard cards were being pushed to an extreme degree. There is no doubt in my mind that cards like Oro and Oko are prime examples of this and would have been absolutely absurd by the standards of even a few years prior. Both Oro and Oko end up being banned in a lot of formats. Oko being banned in like everything but Commander off the top of my head, which is kind of wild. That is a big accolade to hold. But this wasn't just a strive to be more powerful than previous things. There was a bit of innovation for innovation's sake. Yeah, but your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could, they didn't stop to think if they should. Companion is a mechanic so broken, I genuinely believe it might be the most broken mechanic ever made. Uh, Pre-nerf, it ruined everything. Most new mechanics in Magic can be described as a very enough kicker. Yeah, that's kicker. Everything's kicker. Companion, at least, might be one of the closest pivots away from that. And I applaud the attempt to move away from... The, the typical and the mundane. Innovation is good. In a truly abstract sense, it's still kicker, I guess, but not really. But Companion was something so far outside the realms of what players expected. Something that had an analogue to Pokemon, or to Commanders in the Command Zone from the format Commander, or to Special Summons and Extra Decks in Yu-Gi-Oh! The whole mechanic felt quite alien to most Magic players. But beyond that, it wasn't just a strange new mechanic innovating and making Magic feel different. Like I said, it dominated pretty much every format that it showed up in, especially pre-nerf. Companion was fundamentally broken by some of the some of the tenets that Gavin points out. You had card advantage by having more cards in your opening hand. It circumvented the randomized nature of the game by giving you access to a combo piece or a core engine card of your deck at all times. The nerf to make Companion cost three mana to put it into your hand before you could cast it did not solve the issue. It only sort of improved or fixed it slightly. And even with the nerf, Lurus was one of the top five most played cards in modern, uh, lending to a ban earlier this year. Companion was a hell of a mistake. Companion's a really interesting one as well, because people spend a lot of time trying to figure out how they could print a fixed version of it, where instead of being on the broken side, you're pulling it back more to the middle. But Companion's a mechanic that I wonder if there even is a middle ground for. It's either they're boring and unplayable, or they fundamentally change magic to an extent that they become omnipresent like Lurus and Co. did. I actually grow a little bit tired of the conversation of how you could fix Companion. I've seen it so much, and I've never been convinced that any of it really would fix it. Companion really was one of the worst mechanics. However, let's give credit where credit is due. Wizards of the Coast have managed to course correct and downpower their latest sets. But arguably, we've had uh, what end up being weaker, perhaps more boring sets in the forms of Strixhaven and Kaldaheim. It's a bit early days to really comment on Kamigawa, and Streets of New Commander spoilers are happening as I record this video, if you're catching it in the future. And Kamigawa, by all extents and purposes, was a success. Uh, visually, aesthetically, narratively, and people seem to... Resonate with the cards too, even if they aren't accelerating uh, uh, older formats towards some sort of horrible endgame like some sets have done in recent times. It is truly a difficult balance, like I said, but I guess it comes back to that point that Mark says about players being more likely to forgive you for broken than boring. And I think I agree with it. I am personally often a critic of power creep fucking the game up. And I'm often very impassioned about it because I love this game and I enjoy playing it and I hate to see other players unhappy playing it. I want magic to survive. But with that said, I would rather Wizards of the Coast shoot their shot and miss and then course correct or fix after the fact than never trying. Because, well, things like Legacy and Modern exist for these mistakes to live in for the most part. I don't want creativity to be stifled for the rest of time because they're scared of making another Oko. There is an argument that Oko is a good example of how this could be way too far. Like that wasn't an overshoot, that was just 
absurd. How they did that, nobody knows. But I would take a hundred more Throne of Eldraine's, Khans, and Ikoria's over another Amonkhet, Strixhaven, or Kaldheim. And of course there's an issue with all this. Things getting banned is going to cause an issue with investment and burnout of your player base who want to play these formats. Because in order to play these formats, they're going to buy in to a new deck and then get burnt. It's a whole different thing for me to rent a deck, play in a stream or a video, laugh about how broken it is, and have quite an exciting bit of content that everyone can get on board with, and go, ho oh, ho, that's going to get banned. That's one thing. But to buy the cards and go to an event and play a couple of events, then have the cards banned. Sometimes you have cards banned that the rest of the deck just pivots. We have our Drazi deck to this day, even with Eye of Ugin being banned in modern. Oko at his peak, for example, was a real feel bad since he was systematically erased from the game. And good fucking reason why Oko was Broko. But Oko was but one card making it into pretty much every deck. What about people buying all the parts for, I don't know, Hogak during Hogak Spring? Or Eldrazi during Eldrazi Winter? Luckily, for those decks, they pivot into other things. There's a mill deck involving the crabs and the altars, for example, in some formats. And like I said, there's an Eldrazi deck. But sometimes you're left just with a, a, a husk, a shell of a former deck. Some cards become unplayable when they lose their combo pieces or their engines that get banned. It's a feel bad for sure, but it's... It's got to be better than the alternative, right? Sets that have zero impact on older formats, or are forgotten once they have left standard. I think so, but I find it hard to say with any certainty which I prefer. I, I think I lead towards the broken. I think the broken and then banned out thing wouldn't be so bad if it wasn't coupled with the ongoing upwards power creep in general. Sometimes things are so broken, so much so that it's obvious they won't last. Like your Eldrazi decks, your Hogax and your Uros. But some things aren't that oppressive in an overt sense. They just kind of slide in, sit down, and they never fucking leave. Your prismatic endings and your murk tide regents. These things are so unbelievably good, but not forcefully dumpstering you. Although, don't get me wrong, we've all lost enough games to these cards, right? But it's less overt. It's less aggressive. And this leads, with Modern Horizon sets especially, to a sort of artificial rotation, where your old favourite decks and cards... <laughs> They no longer are viable to compete. Even if you aren't jumping on the absolute bannable new hotness, you still need to buy a shit ton of new staples or just move to another deck as your deck just gradually gets power crept out of the format. If all the staples weren't completely pushed out at all times, the feel bads for having your decks banned out and not being able to keep up with the, 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 the broken nature of power crept design wouldn't be so bad. We're in an interesting spot right now where arguably we've not had anything really powerful come out since Modern Horizons 2. Although the cards from Modern Horizons 2 do just sit around being frustrating to an extent. There's a weird thing where I kind of miss the extremity of Oko or pre banned Luris or Hogak compared to the omnipresence of fucking Murktide region right now, which I do think was a huge design mistake on the powerful end of things, right? The exciting end of things, but it's led to a boring, a boring meta game. Boring formats almost in some ways. Perhaps I am just nostalgic for the Esther year of Tassigas and Loxodon Smiters in Modern, and I'm just a paper boomer who needs to accept that things change and the game moves on, perhaps. That's something that I need to reflect on a little bit and try to try to come to appreciate. I do want to close out this video by reiterating that the tightrope upon which game designers walk between broken and boring is just that. It's a fucking tightrope. And I think for the vast majority of sets, if like 90% of magic sets, maybe more, they fall on one side or the other. Getting into that central point, being in the strand, is not easy. I do, however, think Wizards as an entity could spend more money on its human resources, on paying their incredible designers, art directors, and world building teams more money. Also supporting them with teams that play test and focus group test this stuff. I always get the impression that Wizards is making hundreds of millions of dollars for Hasbro, but Hasbro isn't willing to treat them like the golden goose they really are, with the love and attention that it deserves. They still seem to be this small indie company making like the biggest card game in the world that makes shit tons of money. I say the biggest, I guess Pokemon make, make more money, but that's not the point. Pay your fucking staff and hire some playtest teams, Hasbro. It's not fucking hard. But what do you think? Do you err on the side of caution? Would you prefer there was more boring sets like your original Theros? Or do you think throwing haste to the wind, is that even a term? Balls to the wall. The bannable broken shit is more fun. Do you believe, like I do, that Innistrad was the perfect set? What set do you think towed this line perfectly? I'd love to hear that in the comment section below. Because it's Innistrad, right? It's got to be Innistrad. If you enjoyed this video, perhaps check out this one here where I talk about do casual players need to fucking get good? 
bit of introspection goes a long way. A bit of introspection goes a long way. Thank you for watching. Hopefully you enjoyed this video too. And I'll see you all soon. Ta-ta for now.